So, I don't know, I guess you could start the way you usually start saying who you are. And you don't need audio, all the audio? The, they have, all, all basically have oh, audio, plus I'll, then I have... I'm, in, I'm impressed. And then I have this with, like, back up well, as well. I am uh, Dr. Lester Grinspoon. I'm a, uh, 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 let's start. Let's start. I am Dr. Lester Grinspoon, an associate professor of psychiatry at the Harvard Medical School Emeritus, uh, and I am the uh, author of, uh, do you want me to tell about my book? Uh, what do you want me to say? Just that much? I am a... Let's, let's start with, like, what got you into medicine in the first place? Well, I was always interested in medicine, and... Uh, Curiously, the uh, the part of it. Uh, well, when I, it goes back to I dropped out of high school early my senior year, went into the Barge Marine, then came back. Decided that wasn't for me. No. It wasn't. Uh, it was not my dish. It was uh, my romantic uh, notion of the sea that got the best <laughs> of me. And when I come back, I. Uh, I worked for almost a year while I struggled to get into college because they didn't, you know, at that time, someone dropping out of senior year, not early in the senior year in high school, I must be a disturbed person. Yeah. <laughs> so I worked uh, at the Beth Israel Hospital in the surgery unit as an attendant, and I became fascinated with surgery. Yeah. And so that led to my interest in medicine. And then uh, uh, that carried me into medical school. And as I got more acquainted with the vistas that medicine offered, mm -hmm. uh, I went through a number of them before I made a final decision. But finally, it was psychiatry mm -hmm. that, uh, uh, that uh, attracted my attention more than any other. And that's what I went mm -hmm. into. That's what I trained in. What was in psychiatry that you found fascinating? Well, again, this is all, it was psychoanalysis. Hmm. I mean, if you wanted to be a psychoanalyst in hmm. Boston, uh, you went into medical school, and I'll, I'll, and once you once you graduated from medical school and you were in your psychiatric no. residency, then you could apply for training in the Boston psych, Boston psychoanalyst. Institute, yeah. and uh, I did exactly that, but uh, I became quite disabused mm -hmm. of psychoanalysis. I graduated mm -hmm. seven years, graduated from that institute. Mm -hmm. uh, you did it along with everything else that you do in my residency. Mm -hmm. But uh, after, by the time I uh, got into practice, I had a lot of reservation about it. I, I did psychotherapy too, which I loved, mm -hmm. but psychoanalysis, I couldn't. You know, I felt, well, my, the other candidates or students of the mm -hmm. Boston Psychoanalysis, they, they seemed to be happy doing this and so forth, but uh, but I, I couldn't see the results. Mm -hmm. And uh, it got to a point uh, where I was beginning to feel a little fraudulent. I wasn't sure that they're traveling to see me four times a week and paying no. the fee and everything, that they were getting much out of it. At least I could uh, no. reassure myself that they were. Whereas with psychotherapy, the patient which is all once or twice a week in the months, and it was sitting down and it was a face-to-face -face exchange. No. And that's part of the problem I have with psychoanalysis, you know. Uh, you as the analysts look no. this way over the head or to the side of someone no. lying on the couch looking no. away from you. And it, I don't think you can accomplish anything no. without eye contact, frankly. No. And no. The whole business of free I won't go into that, but I became so disaffected with it that uh, no. while... Uh, my mentor uh, at, the, uh, at the Mass Mental Health Center, where I did my residency and was on the, was on the faculty, mm -hmm. uh, he had 
approached me ahead on this, and when I told him, I just, he kept pushing me, and finally I said, no. Mm -hmm. uh, I said, uh, you know, Elvin, everybody else must be able to make it work, but I can't, yeah. so I'm not going to take But I paid dues to the psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic Institute for another five years, yeah. and for me, those dues were steep at that time. Mm -hmm. But I felt, that it must have been because I felt that I was a little guilty, I was abandoning yeah. this thing. But indeed, I, uh, I, I felt I had to. Mm -hmm. But then five years later, I said, hey, this is ridiculous. In no. fact, it was a night when I was stoned. <laughs> and I said, you're fooling yourself, it's not you. No. Uh, it doesn't work. No. Uh, psych as far as I'm concerned now, and there are so many people out here who would no. gladly shoot me for saying this, <laughs> but I just, I don't think, I mean, I loved reading Freud when no. I was young, and no. I loved the world of it, but I felt, I've never seen anybody really, not just my patients, but no. when you look at it, I have one relative who's been through two analyses, no. analyses and she doesn't look on she is the same person she was when she went into it. So I don't want to get into that too much, but I this was in the fifties. Uh, so this was. Uh, let's see. I started my residency in nineteen fifty-eight, mm. and so I must have entered the institute about nineteen fifty-nine and nineteen sixty. No. Uh, no. And then it, it takes about seven years. No. And psychoanalysis was still kind of very prevalent way oh, of doing psychology. It was, at that I point. mean, every department of psychiatry, yeah. at least in the, in the academic institutions, yeah. psychoanalysis was uh, yeah. was the uh, was the guiding star. Yeah. And uh, I, uh, it was really rough going for me to have to. Yeah. come to terms with some of the things I thought I understood uh, were not true. Yeah. So, but I was very happy to do psychotherapy, mm -hmm. and I continued to do with great pleasure. And I, I, I could see that I could get somewhere there, and um, that's what uh, I had to have that to uh, to uh, do it. So I did that throughout my mm -hmm. profession. Again, I was a full-time academic. And mm -hmm. Early in the morning, yeah. stay later in the late in the afternoon to see just a couple of patients a day. But I also read work. that you are the first uh, psychiatrist to give lithium for bipolar. Yeah, that's when I was chief resident, mm. and uh, I had a patient who was bipolar, and wow, she was climbing the wall. Mm. We had to secluded her, and I had read. Uh, Oh, what's their name? Uh, what's his name now in Australia? Uh, yeah, I, mean, I read that it's yeah, kind of hard in, in 1948, I think he first published it. Uh, the name will come to me. Yeah. And I read it, you know, in my readings, on it, and I, you know, we were using, uh, we were using all sorts of drugs to try, yeah. and, and they were awful. Yeah. And when I came across their work, or his work, I yeah. came quite remember, I decided, well, I'm going to, so I called up Kenmore, Kenmore Pharmacy, and I said, hey, could you pack lithium as a carbohydrate, uh, uh, lithium carbonate, I mean, lithium carbonate as a, as a, uh, uh, I'd like a 400 milligram capsule, mm -hmm. and, and would you give me a pile of those? Mm -hmm. and, and when they called and said it was ready, I went down. Them and I started to heal this lady, and it was remarkable. Yeah. She stopped climbing the walls <laughs> for sure. Yeah. And so that everybody in the hospital was, now you know, it, was, it took a long time for lithium to come available yeah. because in our system, doctors get acquainted with new drugs through the pharmaceutical uh, industry. Yeah. Uh, they, they sponsor the research on their drugs, uh, they run all the advertising in the journals, they seduce doctors with everything from their golf fees to dinners to trips to who knows where. Uh, but sadly, that 
that's what pharmacological education is with yeah. doctors now. So uh, lithium, you could, and, and the point is, a pharmaceutical company would have got hold of something, let's say, like Prozac, mm. you know, which clearly worked. Yeah. Uh, you, you, would, you can get a patent for 20 years, a pharmaceutical. Yeah. And it usually takes about three years for the company to get through all the hurdles yeah. with various phase studies. But then you have 17 years, you can charge whatever you want. Yeah. And so you get a drug. That's how all the pharmaceutical things come aboard. Yeah. But then finally there was the Orphan Drug Act uh, passed by the Congress. And, uh, uh, and they... But this allowed the government to give the exclusive right to mandate the exclusive rights to distribute distribute the lithium yeah. uh, um, for I think it was seven or eight years, not the usual twenty years. Yeah. And so lithium, you could then buy it as a pharmaceutical, yeah. uh, and that's when it uh, it began yeah. to be well known that something. Which is very useful. It's not that it, it's not like cannabis. It's not a you know it's not a toxicity free drug. And the, the symptom which people find most annoying there are two of them. One is their personality seem to be sandpapered down a little bit, and also uh, uh, they gain tend to gain weight. Which they don't like. so it's not a it's not a perfect drug by any. Yeah. But it was such a big improvement on what we had at that time. Was it kind of then gradually shifting from this kind of psychoanalytic movement? Yeah, to that was also true. You're not, you know, there are still people who go into psychoanalytic training. But, you know, there are very few, few people who went into it in my generation who continue. I was the first one out, I think, in this area. And, in fact, I, as I say, I didn't resign from the Institute. Until uh, yeah. five years, I continued to play, pay dues uh, yeah. for five years because uh, I felt a little bit uncomfortable that maybe yeah. this, you know, was me and I shouldn't. Uh, but at any rate, but nowadays, I think it's, uh, I think from my point of view, fortunately taken much less seriously yeah. than it was. Yeah. Now, it's not that it didn't contribute something to our understanding of people, yeah. but as a therapy, no. Uh, it was a, not a success. No. But do you think it has kind of swung the other extreme in a way that now, when you go to a psychiatrist, you get medication that is. Yeah, I think for a lot. That's there's definitely a movement that there's movement in mm -hmm. that direction because, you know, uh, with some of these drugs, at least you can get symptomatic mm -hmm. improvement. No. Uh, but and that's. Know, a lot easier and less expensive and quicker and everything so that that I think is true it's the reason why I think if I were going into a specialty now psychiatry would be the one I would go into uh, don't ask me what it would be but I don't think it'd be psychiatry because I went into the psychiatry into psychiatry with the idea that Freud Freudian analysis was my objective. In fact, I was so keen on it that I was determined to pick for my analyst one of the three people in Boston who had been analyzed by Freud. No. Uh, um, Mrs. Rock, Beta Rock, who was the one. No, okay, yeah. No. And, uh, and the two Deutsches, mm. which, who were also uh, Felix and only the Deutsch were analyzed by mm. Freud. So Beta Rock. Um, did my analysis, mm. and I, I had, I almost got kicked out of the institute. I don't know if it's any relevance to you, but uh, as I told you at lunch, I have some social activism in me, mm. which uh, I inherited from my father or yeah. wherever. Yeah. But uh, during the Vietnam War, <laughs> I think it was about. Uh, it must have been about 19, uh, in the 60s, it was early, late 60s, it was early yeah. in the day. The first uh, 
demonstration against the Vietnam War in the Boston area. It started in Wellesley, a town I, went, I lived in. And the idea was to walk from uh, well, Wellesley to Watertown the first night and then assemble very early in the morning and do the rest of the walk into the Boston Common. And that's what I became a, a ragtag band, I can tell you. <laughs> and uh, the next morning, you know, I was supposed to be at my classes at the Psychoanalytic Institute, and there was one class from 9 to 10.30, then a coffee break for a half hour, ran right on the clock, and then at 11 to 12.30 was the second one. And people during the coffee break would go into this beautiful uh, uh, room in the building was a cop 15 Commonwealth Fab, beautiful building looks out on Commonwealth Avenue, had Steve Bay windows. And everybody sit there sipping their coffee and looking out, you know, whether it was winter yeah. or spring or summer, it was always a beautiful sight because Commonwealth Avenue has that wonderful yeah. island in the middle where there's always something growing. And, and we'd be standing, well, this day I wasn't standing in front. And that troop of protesters went by yeah. 15 Commonwealth Avenue just at the moment that they were drinking there, yeah. drinking their coffee. And uh, one of them, a friend of mine, uh, felt she had to report it to the psychoanalytic authorities. Uh -huh. And I was a special on ad hoc committee of the Boston Psychoanalytic Institute was instituted to. Yeah to, you know, talk to me, whatever the verb they used about yeah. this, acting out, as they called it, <laughs> acting out. And uh, so I was nearly canned from the Institute at that point, yeah. because they, they felt that was, uh, you know, imagine. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, that was, that was part of my problem with yeah. psychoanalysis. It was... Uh, really, in some ways, chasing its own tail, yeah. and uh, I, uh, so I eventually, I did it for a while with the encouragement of this person, an yeah. older person in my institution, who was very interested in me and psychoanalysis, but eventually I had to give it up. No. Yeah. I mean, the kind of, what MAPS is doing with the MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, it's, well, it's not psychoanalytic, necessarily with the MDMA, but they are trying to kind of... I wrote the first paper on that. Oh, really? Yeah, that it's all. called, yeah, it's, in the, you'll see it if you go to my papers, it's yeah. called uh, so, something of assisted possible mm -hmm. assistance of psychotherapy mm -hmm. with, uh, with, uh, with psychoactive drugs, yeah. and, drugs and uh, particularly uh, MD, methylene no. dioxide, meth methamphetamine. No. Uh, and now, you know, a, s a research by the name of Doblin, mm. uh, who became who became a fourth author on on my revision of that paper, because he so, so that paper is around two forms, the original that I did, and then, uh, but he continues to do this. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> shall I turn it off? Or it'll, let me see if I can. I don't know if I can turn it off. Maybe we should just turn that mm -hmm. off for a minute. All right. Well, I mean, you can, if you want to pick it up, I guess. Yeah, well, leave it on and you just edit it out. No, no. Uh, it shouldn't take long. No. If, if my wife were up, she'd mm -hmm. make it better. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I met Rick Dublin last year in London, psychedelic mm -hmm. conference, and he, they've been trying to get the cannabis research for PTSD also yeah. going, but they've been kind of getting a lot of pushing back from the different government organizations. Yes. But now it seems like the DEA might actually... It looks very... Yeah. That's going to happen. Yeah. I can assure you, Schedule 1 is going to be abandoned. Now, I don't know if they're going to... I don't think they're going to you know, throw up the whole mm -hmm. Comprehensive Drug Act of 1970. Yeah. But I think this is just going to be a change of schedule one, which would be great if they they took out cannabis and psychedelics. Mm. But I, what I, my understanding is, it's just going to be cannabis. Yeah. But it 
least that's a, no. that's a great step forward. No. Have you, like from before Rick Dublin had tried to get this cannabis research, was there a lot of efforts of getting cannabis or researching cannabis before, but it didn't really... It, it can't get anywhere. You know, I was funded by the, uh, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, and they, uh, they uh, kept my funding through the publication of Marijuana Reconsidered, and I was a little bit nervous about that. <laughs> but then, and they had no problem with the amphetamine book because mm -hmm. Wasn't promoting any use of it or anything. I mean, was, I, I was making it clear that this was a drug that had very few medical uses no. and uh, and was uh, had severe risks. No. And, and in fact, it led. I was the first one to testify before Senator. Uh, well, I wish I didn't have so much to know here. Senator Nelson's committee, who wanted to go into amphetamines, mm -hmm. and uh, that, that he was the one who spearheaded the you, people, mm -hmm. nobody, you know, amphetamines were prescribed and used like water. Yeah. And then the cocaine book, but when psychedelic drugs mm -hmm. came along, uh, that's when they, they stopped yeah. supporting me. Yeah. And then I had to look around for funds. No. It was curious that my own brother, who was a billionaire, <laughs> wouldn't support and help me out there no. because he doesn't believe in marijuana. I mean, you know, he's part of my generation. Yeah. It's just that we've gone a little different here. Yeah. Do you remember that, like, the drug scares? And, you, I mean, you mentioned, like, you were also brainwashed like everybody else, but do you remember... Was it the reefer madness, or was it the kind of what kind of material was put out there to kind of? Well, I think the uh, the uh, uh, the people who were reefer madness was certainly yeah. you know that was the first one that was maybe nineteen thirty seven yeah. I think or something like that. Now, of course, you know, young people particularly like to watch it as a as a a period of ridiculous film, right. uh, you know, purporting to, yeah. to demonstrate the evils of a yeah. great uh, social problem. Uh, uh, but then afterwards, it was more the, uh, well, what was that organization? I can't even remember the name now, the Comprehensive Drug Abuse, something. I mean, yeah. they, uh, that was very, they spent a lot of money on yeah. Promoting uh, false notions about this, uh, and you know it was it was just uh, the the intensity of this was such that people just began to believe it. And so you know, really, since 1937, physicians used to know about this because they knew about the use of cannabis as a medicine from 1848. When O'Shaughnessy first brought, brought it back to London, and then it started to appear as an alcoholic solution on the on, uh, pharmacy shelves, nobody knew about smoking, but it was soluble in alcohol. Tink, yeah, it was called cannabis yeah. indica. It was a tincture of, uh, of cannabis, and those doctors they didn't worry about overdose. Mm -hmm. They worry about underdose yeah. because you know you, you had no way of knowing. It's going to take two hours before the symptom to say, "Well, my pain is in my ear is is now diminished." Yeah. So it was a tough way to use it, but at least they didn't have to worry about overdose. Yeah. Um, but they, there was no uh, you know bioassay that you could do to say, "Well, this ten milligrams of THC." And I didn't even know about tea. Well, they didn't know about it. No. There, there was no way of knowing what yeah. this was all about. No. But then um, that came to an end when, uh, in 19, 18, 19, 1898 and 1900, uh, respectively, aspirin, a 
acetyl-halic salicylic acid was synthesized and barbiturates. Uh, and, you know, now, uh, two, they were two of the major symptoms, you know, soporific and an analgesic. And now, doctors had, you know, nice shiny pills that they could prescribe that knew the dosage and... Uh, and that led to a tremendous loss of interest on the part of the physician. Yeah. <coughs> and over the course of the years, you know, uh, and by the time we get to 1937, the Maryland Attacks Act, yeah. <coughs> which can, I think, be said to be the beginning of this extraordinary popular delusion about cannabis in the 80s. Year, what is it, eight, uh, you know, prohibition that, uh, that was a product of this. That's when it all began. Now, and now we're kind of seeing some cracks. In the oh, are we seeing crack? You know, after marijuana reconsidered, it came out. You know, the New York Times had front page. No. Sunday review the best dope on pod so far. It, it no. really no. created a big... Uh, and, and there are people who think it started the discussion no. of marijuana in this no. country. Uh, but, and I'll tell you a funny anecdote. Carl Sagan, who was my closest friend, we would read each other's manuscripts before they were published. Uh, he read Marijuana Reconsidered. And he said, Lester, that's an excellent book, but you made one big mistake. What was that? He said, you will send the last chapter. It will take 10 years to get rid of this awful prohibition. Yeah. I said, and you? What? Why is that? He said, two years. <laughs> <laughs> Carl, of course, was the ultimate rational man. Yeah. <laughs> and he read the book and he Everybody else who's going to read the book, yeah. some to come to the same conclusion. That might have been, might have made it uh, to you. But at any rate, that was, uh, I thought that was pretty funny. Yeah. But, uh, that was my big mistake. It yeah. was a big mistake. I never dreamed it was going to take as many years as yeah. it did. But, uh, Has it been yeah. frustrating? Kind of like you well, already put all the information out there, but people just... So well, I kept and, working away at it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I wasn't the only one. There yeah. were a lot of other people. Uh, who, uh, who, I mean, a lot of people became involved in this yeah. one because, you know, it was a remarkably useful medicine. Yeah. It's a recreational drug. It's a medicinal drug. Yeah. And it's what I call an enhancement drug that can yeah. enhance a variety of human experience. Well, that's... You know, as people come to understand that through experience, and especially once medical marijuana came along in the late 90s, uh, people had an opportunity to observe for themselves. They weren't going to turn green yeah. or, or a fly or something. And they came to understand that this was not a, a very dangerous drug. Yeah. And that it had utilities, at least they could see a medical utility. Yeah. And you know, if they thought about it long enough, I mean, you know, what would you rather have? A bunch of people use alcohol as a race, recreational yeah. drug, or people who use cannabis. Yeah. Cannabis is so much better as a recreational yeah. drug. You get much more out of it, no hangovers, yeah. no damage to the liver, no, I won't go into it all. Yeah. And then, of course, what we're learning about. Uh, its capacity to enhance. I mean, more and more, you know, a casual user can't know yeah. about its capacity to enhance yeah. uh, a variety of things. I mean, he can know about the enhancement of, of taste. Yeah. He can know, because that's just there. Yeah. He can know about the enhancement of sexual, of a sexual experience. That's just there. But if he wants to know how it can enhance writing, or the appreciation of art, or so many other things, yeah. uh, that he's got to become, he's got to get more use, more experience with the drug to yeah. be able to appreciate that. But I think more and more people, I have a 
website now mm -hmm. called marijuana-youth.com where I have these essays mm -hmm. from people. I've, a I've asked people to write me an essay on how they think mm -hmm. cannabis might have enhanced how, how they found it useful in their mm -hmm. lives. Not rec beyond recreation, beyond yeah. medicine. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's that's how my, my ideas have developed since yeah. marijuana reconsidered. Yeah. Really, when my when my son Danny uh, he had suffered so from the uh, nausea and vomiting of cancer chemotherapy, yeah. and uh, we didn't use marijuana at that time. We heard about this, and uh, my plucky wife went up to Wellesley High School talking a lot and asked one of those kids for some marijuana. And they, she didn't smoke it, but he did 20 years, about 20 minutes before his, uh, his scheduled chemotherapy. And we were just so amazed. Uh, he lost it. When I would walk into the treatment room at the children's hospital with my, in my office, she'd bring them in. And usually, he was at he didn't like it. His face reflected. He didn't like what's going to happen in the hours after he gets that injection. And her face then started to reflect his anxiety about this. This time I walked into the treatment room and they were joking with yeah. each other. I said, hey, what's, you know, what, what's going on here? What, yeah. you guys, let me in on the joke. And she told me what had happened. See, she asked before, after we had spoken to a physician who uh, was coming to, to take over the apartment in Harvard, we were invited to meet him, meet him at, the, uh, at a dinner party. And he asked me if, I, if I'd ever heard of uh, anybody smoking marijuana as an aging medicine. And I said, well, and because he, he was the person who gives can he was a, mm -hmm. uh, he was taking Sidney Farber's mm -hmm. and succeeding him as the head of uh, oncology at the Children's Hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, he told the story about this 17-year-old boy mm -hmm. who would, would really raise hell about him. And then one day he came in and got on the gurney heads and, and just left. And then the next time, the, they were all stunned as he said, so long, James, he got off. Hey, wait a minute, yeah. Jimmy. What? Uh, what's the, what's the deal here? Why? Uh, and he told them, "Oh, he just sat out in the parking lot and smoked a powder of a joint before he came in yeah. the last two times." And, yeah. and that's what Mitzi said. We ought to get hold of him. <laughs> and I felt, "No, we can't do that." <laughs> I can't believe I said that, yeah. but I did. I said it was against the law, yeah. and also we don't want to jeopardize, uh, you know. Danny's care, that, mm. you know, both silly reasons, mm. but at any rate, Betsy didn't pay any attention. She went out and got some weed smoke, and, and we didn't have to mm. deal with that part of his illness mm. you know, the rest of the time he survived. It was amazing. There's a lot of, lot of parents now, with, if they have children with epilepsy, for instance, and trying to seek help from medical cannabis and then they even move to other states where yeah, it's very exactly. It's so that important. Yeah. I mean, it was, from that from then on, we had to be sure that yeah. we didn't smoke it. This is a portrait of painting of the yeah. yeah. Oh, you haven't got it there yet. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. I thought it was in the screen. You don't have to do that. It doesn't have to be in the screen. Um. Yeah, but actually led into research about the kind of anti nausea effects as well of, of cannabis. Well, uh, the research was apparent. Mm. I mean, this yeah. drug worked yeah. good with nausea. Yeah. It worked better than anything else. Yeah. No side effects yeah. and no toxic effects. Mm. I mean, what else could you want? Yeah. I mean, it was, it's perfect. And you know, I envisage the day when, uh, you know, right now physicians are very slow mm -hmm. to get involved with this medicine, mm -hmm. cannabis. 
and uh, they, you know, they're going to have, they have person, you know, a patient, and they, some of them, like a lot of the AIDS patients, going to have, look, yeah. scale's going up, why is this going on? Yeah. But, well, I know, doctor, to tell you the truth, I'm, I've learned to smoke marijuana before yeah. I try to eat. And the, and the, and those doctors are catching on to it. Yeah. But a lot of the other, because, are not, because they don't have that yeah. type of experience. And I think as, as more and more of them get that experience, yeah. it will become a very important drug, yeah. you know, like penicillin. And, you know, penicillin was discovered in 1928. Uh, it was 1941, and the two uh, British physicians took it down from the shelf and yeah. discovered what a great, you know, uh, antibiotic it was. Yeah. And here we were just entering into World War II yeah. when so yeah. many of the deaths in war yeah. because of the fact, I mean, it was a real yeah. boom. But like marijuana, penicillin was inexpensive once it was produced on the yeah. continent of scale. Yeah. It was remarkably non-toxic. And three, it was very versatile. It yeah. treat so many grand positive people, spiroketal infections and so yeah. forth. Well, penicillin, very, I mean, um, marijuana, very inexpensive, yeah. remarkably free of toxicity, and very versatile. Mm. This is the same kind of phenomenon, mm. only that became a pharmaceutical, yeah. and, you know, cannabis, the use of cannabis, and then we not, you know, it's now cannabinopathic medicine, yeah. I mean, there, but, you know, I hope because, uh, well, it's going to happen, doctors. There are still, like, I refer patients to a doctor mm -hmm. in Boston who will write the permission out of Massachusetts mm -hmm. that people can get medicine, that medicine, but you have a permission. But many doctors just won't write it. No. So I send it to that person and he will write that permission so they can use it. But it's, uh, it's, uh, it's been a remarkable yeah. uh, development. I mean, first of all, the development of it, of the collapse of the prohibition, yeah. but secondly, the development of it, uh, our understanding of how useful it is as a medicine yeah. is parallel. Yeah. Do you think doctors just don't necessarily know about it? Do they have found beneficial effects or because it's not? A drug that has been through the randomized controlled trials that they kind of they believe that. Yeah, that's, that's, I think probably uh, yeah. more the, the latter because they've been, you know, it's kind of got to pass large double blind controlled yeah. studies and, yeah. have the, and have the trademark of a pharmaceutical company. Well, neither is true here. No. And, uh, there are physicians who are dead, still dead set against, lots of them dead set against it. They, you know, they, uh, they're, they're talking about uh, an understanding of it, which is, uh, you know, decades old no. now. No. It's not what uh, we understand about it now. I don't know if it, it's like a thing like endocannabinoid system taught in medical school nowadays. And well, I don't know if it is now. But it's going to be, yeah. because I don't think, and it may be now, because yeah. you can't study uh, neurophysiology without talking, you know, we talk about the other system, yeah. you know, but you can't, you can't, you can't ignore it, it's there now, yeah. so I think, you know, it's going to take time, but eventually doctors will be on board, yeah. eventually. Yeah, and I guess that kind of one one of the things that's also kind of preventing it is because it was used to only, basically the insect was almost only by smoking and smoking versus yeah, normally. Yeah, but exactly. nowadays with all the kind of new vaporizers, yeah. all the kind well, of different technologies. Well, that, uh, that, that's one thing. And yeah. also that now, uh, when I prescribe, I don't because I don't know what, but when I advise a patient, yeah. someone who comes to me, you know, I will discuss with him you know, that 
there is what I call the 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 therapeutic uh, essence or um, oh, blindness. What were you saying? Assemblage. Oh, that's the word. <laughs> this age word's been out of that. Yeah, and, and it consists of three things. CBD. We didn't know much about mm. CBD in yeah. the 1970s. Yeah. Everybody thought, well, it's just one of the many, yeah. what well, we then thought to be about 60 cannabinoids. Mm. It's, now, it's now way above that. Yeah. But the one we were interested in was THC, but it turns out cannabidiol, mm. or CBD, mm. is uh, one of the ones in this therapeutic ensemble. Mm. Uh, there are three. TV, uh, CBD, THC, a tetrahydrocannabinol. And the third essential part of therapeutic uh, formula is the terpenoids, the, some of the phytochemicals that come from the bud. It's, it's the reason I have trouble with, uh, with people who make oils, because you don't know what's, where, what's happened to the, uh, the terpenoids. But if you get it, uh, you're sure that it comes from the bud and has uh, those three constituents. Then you, as a physician, say, I hope there will be uh, uh, a kind of uh, uh, a spread of uh, these uh, uh, products. And some of them will have high CBD and low THC, like, uh, as we mentioned at lunch, like, uh, uh, Charlotte's uh, yeah, Charlotte's Web, I think that's something like 20 to 1, you yeah. see, you know, one. On the other hand, and there'll be no high, people who don't want experience, you don't have to worry, you will get no high, but you will get the therapy. Yeah. On the other hand, if you have some degree of depression, it's a great thing, not a powerful antidepressant, but it, great in the sense that it's, it, yeah. it can be used by many people without any problem. Yeah. Uh, and so a lot of people like to take it, take, you know, lower that, change that ratio so it may be more, because CBD and THC, CBD inhibits the psychoactive effect. So you've got to get the THC up high enough so the CBD lets some of it shine through. Yeah. So you would have a, a an array of these capsules because yeah. it'd be better to take them orally because the effect will last. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there will be an array of these capsules, and the what will be different is the ratio of THC, uh, THC to CBD. Yeah. Yeah. And you know the doctor can advise them on it. Just don't want to, you know, yeah. And you may play around with that, you know, get some cats. None of them is going to, none of them will hurt you. No. So, uh, and they may be very useful. No. And most of the pharmaceuticals are targeted, like one molecule is trying to target very specifically a area of the brain, yeah, exactly. which, is, which is kind of maybe a dream that's not even really... Well, it may come, kind of, you know, eventually we may get to that. But, yeah. uh, as it stands now, and I would say this is tentative, like every step we've been along the way, yeah. right now it seems like CBD and THC yeah. plus the phytochemicals. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can get a therapeutic effect from CBD. You can get it from THC. Yeah. You can't get it from the phytochemicals alone. But if you get this combination, uh, you will get a better therapeutic effect, and it will cover yeah. uh, more symptoms. Syndrome. So that's why I am urging people to do it that way. Um, I don't know if you mind me asking, but what ways has cannabis enhanced your life? Well, it's awful hard to know because I've been using it since uh, 1973. Yeah. And uh, I don't know what my life would be like without it, but I must yeah. say I've been very happy. I think medically, you know, I have, I don't want to get too 
personal about my condition, but I come with condition wanting them to go claim my life before a while. But uh, I, I think it slowed these things down. And that is probably wishful thinking more than anything I could ever prove. But I have a hunch, you know, uh, that eventually, eventually, um, people will see a capsule that I take every night. Do yeah. you know Valerie Corral at all in Santa Cruz, California? Well, she takes them off the beach. And they are about 18 to 1 CBD THC. Yeah. With, because the capsule is just the, the yeah. bud ground up in a capsule with that kind of ratio. Yeah. I take one of those every night. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't take them in the morning. I could. Mm. But if I want to get high that yeah. night, I yeah. sometimes do. And CBD won't let you get high. Yeah. So I take it at night because yeah. it's uh, it's also a, somewhat of a soporific mm. and help me to go to sleep. Yeah. And I've been taking those for years now. Yeah. Years. And I've been using cannabis, what I say, for more than four decades. Yeah. So it's hard for me to say what it would be like without. I have some serious medical problems. Yeah. But I, I live a very satisfying life. I won't attribute, I can't, don't know what to attribute to cannabis, but it yeah. certainly has a lot to do with the woman I'm married to. Yeah. We've been married 62 years, come this June. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I can't answer what it would have been like without it, I don't know, because it's been very much a yeah. part of my life once I overcame my, you yeah. know, from someone who started out, boy, this is a very horrible yeah. drug. <laughs> I may now have, yeah. uh, a very different attitude to it. Yeah. At least, I mean, it seems like you cannot really pinpoint any harmful effects of long-term use. Absolutely not. Yeah. Absolutely not. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I can't pinpoint it. I can't pinpoint any mm. way in which it's prolonged no. my life, but I think mm. it's contributed. I, I have cancer. No. I had, it's, uh, I think the fact that I'm surviving as long yeah. as I have been with this yeah. may have something to do with it. But I'm so afraid to say it publicly because people, you know, they're always saying, well, we've heard this fellow, uh, Rick Simpson, yeah. went around telling people that cannabis cures cancer. Yeah. And any cancer, you know, yeah. be cured. And I'm yeah. so, I wrote a paper called uh, uh, A Note of Caution. Yeah. Because uh, it may be helpful. Yeah. It certainly is helpful with the, with the treatment, you know, cancer chemotherapy and radio, with all the symptoms of the treatment. Yeah. But nobody can persuade me that it cures yeah. cancer. And I think the risk, I, I don't worry about the risk and say, let's say you come to me with, let's say, uh, the first patient I have with Crohn's. Disease. And I said, well, I don't know whether it will help you, but it won't hurt you. No. Give it a try, and I'll tell you how to use it. And, you know, it's well known that it works now, and a whole bunch of other things. But you can't say that about cancer, because it's a time bomb. You, no. know? you don't have time to test that. You know, I get, you know, no. uh, allopathic treatment no. of uh, my cancer, and uh, uh, if it's doing something for that great, if it's no. not, it, no. it, uh, it isn't doing any harm, no. so uh, I continue to take them because, you know, whatever you say about it, it's a great anti-inflammatory, a great antioxidant, no. and uh, no. the, the body isn't going to suffer for no. having uh, things that can deal with inflammation free radicals and yeah. you know, running around. So, uh, as I was saying, I think the day will come when uh, when everybody, you know, I, well, you're too young, but when I was a kid, the vitamin 
pills. You yeah. took your vitamin <laughs> pills at breakfast. Or fish oil. Or oil, oh, oh, that's right. Or, oh, oh, wow, was that awful. I remember that too. I think the day will come when you, you take your CBD, THC, yeah. You know, uh, phytochemical. Sort of part of your. Yeah, uh, it's just part of what you do every yeah. day. Is, uh, uh, and, and just as I'm sure that eventually hospitals will have a room yeah. where there's a vaporizer yeah. that's sitting there and he, the patients can smoke yeah. Yeah. or they can take it orally yeah. uh, because it's a medicine that has such. Uh, versatility yeah. and such limited toxicity. Yeah. The only dangerous way is the only danger it poses when you think you don't have to take anything, but it's mm -hmm. like the people like Rick Simpson, this guy who goes around and says, Wait, all these people, if you have cancer, easy, yeah. just use yeah. marijuana. Yeah. That's dangerous. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, it's not, uh, you might. You know, I don't know whether it's always helpful yeah. in some people, but it isn't going to hurt them. So there is this that that kind of it'll swing from this total prohibition to this kind of oh, over enthusiasm yeah, and yeah, it'll yeah. secure for and eventually you will come yeah. to uh, to uh, you know with time we'll come to a, a more realistic understanding of what it what it is in each direction. Yeah. And next week is the uh, United Nations General Assembly. Mm -hmm. A week before that, do you have a prediction what's going to happen at the United Nations level? I have no idea. No. I have no idea, but the fact is, it's not just the United States mm -hmm. that we're waking up no. from this 80-year-old slumber, no. No. but it's happening around the world. No. And you know, this has been a drug that's been used for 10,000 years, no. 5,000 years no. probably. Chinese Emperor Shen Nung yeah. had a, what did he call it? A, you know, it wasn't a, a pharmacopoeia, the, the neural, yeah. in which he described the illnesses for which it was used and allowing for the different language. It, yeah. It's not too different. It wasn't as inclusive as what we, yeah. we have now. But, uh, uh, so this is a very old medicine. Yeah. And it's just, we've just. Uh, we're just beginning to recognize it in a modern age that has been retarded in its recognition of its uh, medicinal and recreational and, <laughs> and enhancement yeah. values by this awful prohibition. Yeah. You know, some future historian is going to yeah. look at that prohibition yeah. and say, wow. What was that? Where did it come yeah. from? What was that all about? No. Uh, because nobody will believe the drug people will see what, what yeah. you mean. People were put in prison for this. Yeah. They we arrested as many as almost nine hundred thousand, yeah. mostly young people, eighty nine percent for mere yeah. possession yeah. a year yeah. in the year two thousand eleven. It reached the speed. Yeah. Now it's coming down. Yeah. But. You know, we arrested all these young people yeah. and spoiled the careers of many of so. them. And also so, denying the kind of medicinal benefits from people that might have... Exactly. Kind of so we're going to, you know, yeah. we're going to, people are going to judge yeah. this prohibition in a very harsh way yeah. in the future because of, of what it did to people and what it prevented people from having. Yeah. I won't see that day, but at least I'm seeing the day when the walls are crumbling. <laughs> well, hopefully this will last somehow that people can see this kind of happening. Or like leaving these kind of little marks, mm. documentations. To the, so, I mean, because you never know. Everything can always kind of swing one way or another. Like. Now it seems like people are getting more rational and getting more kind of reasonable about this, but you never know. No that. question. No question about it. It's mm -hmm. happening. No. There are still, you know, real diehards. And, no. You know, I think uh, most of them are in my generation. Mm -hmm. And I think as you get the 
younger generations, they're much more open and, yeah. and of course, the most open. And I think when my generation and the generations yeah. uh, immediately before me, as, they, as we disappear, I think this will be, because it's mostly those people who won't give up yeah. their view. They know it's yeah. just like I was at that time. I knew it was a horrible drug. I would say anybody who really believes he knows, go into the Conway Library for a couple of years and, <laughs> and read it all <laughs> and see if you come away with that conclusion. I guess admitting, admitting to oneself that they were wrong, it's, it's not an easy task. To no, nobody finds that easy. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, you know, especially if you've spoken out on it. I, as a physician, advise people you shouldn't use that, no. Carl. It's very harmful. No. No. <laughs> that's uh, that's embarrassing. No. <laughs> Unfortunately, I had the opportunity to uh, no. mend my views on that no. and amend them as the years ago. I continue to amend them as the no. years ago. All right. If you now did a ten-year prediction, what what would it look like? Well, as I say. I think I see hospitals having rooms no. where people can smoke. No. Uh, not freely, but if the doctor thinks this will help, there is a place they can do it, you know. Because I, I remember uh, people thinking that uh, patients have smoked in the hospital. And no. I talked to a couple, they didn't like the smell of it. I mean, no. you know, they, but that, they didn't have any problems. There were a couple of doctors which were okay with it. Yeah. On the wards of the MGH, they don't want to smell it. Yeah. But uh, so there, there could be a smoking room, you know. Yeah. Or if you take it orally, you can, you know, the doctor can prescribe and yeah. so and uh, and as something they take after they go home and so yeah. forth. I mean, for example, if you take the great uh, epidemic that we're having now, the big epidemic of opium, yeah. and then so if these doctors. In addition to prescribing OxyContin, mm -hmm. you know, a synthetic opioid, mm -hmm. uh, would prescribe cannabis for them. Mm -hmm. They could use much less mm -hmm. of the OxyContin mm -hmm. for a shorter period of time. Mm -hmm. And that would dramatically cut the risk of people being mm -hmm. Because a lot of these people who are in this epidemic, you know, with size, first have their experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, at the hands of a doctor, no. and they and doctors hadn't been as careful as they should be in explaining that this drug you're playing with fire a little bit. No. If you, uh, so, but I think that will help that thing out, that problem out, and as we say, many others. Oh, honey, I'm, I'm going to go. He's going to drive me over. Oh, I'll come over when I get there. Yeah. Okay. Love. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. It was a nice meeting. Well, have we exhausted where we... Well, I mean, depends on your timetable completely. I mean, I have a bus at 5. I need to catch that. I'm supposed to go over some. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this book. I really appreciate this. I think you got a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so I do thank you for that. And it's my pleasure.